All right, GPU get. Hi, it's Kai, and today we'll be reviewing the Gigabyte Aorus RX 7900 XTX Elite 24GB. Opening up the box, you'll receive a warranty card and installation guides for the GPU and its anti-sag bracket. The GPU cooler is massive and weighs quite a bit, so you'll be needing it if you don't want it dropping out and damaging the PCIe slot. It looks nicer than a random stick or string in your case, and if you're only going to replace it in like 5 years, it isn't that much of a hassle to install. There's also a little bit of Aorus fan service, so that's pretty cool I guess. The size of this thing is quite big, but it should fit in most ATX cases. I can't say the same for some of the other AIB models or the RTX 4090 though, so measure your cases and check the card dimensions before buying your card of choice. The dense heat fins and the vapor chambers help keep the card cool, and the three 8-pin connectors won't make your card burn. It doesn't have a USB-C port, but it has two HDMI and two display ports instead, which is honestly more than enough for most people. The back plate has a clean and subdued design which I quite like, with only a small eagle at the far end and a small slit of RGB. Speaking of RGB, they are at the top slit, front and on the fence, but I don't like rainbow puke so it'll be turned off. And as with all modern top-end GPUs, it also comes with a dual BIOS switch. Peeling a fresh GPU felt quite cathartic, now I know why so many people like doing it, it's amazing. After taking out the old 1060 and inserting the 7900 XTX, we are ready to start testing it out. The setup for this review is the last gen Ryzen 7 5800X with a 240mm AIO, 32GB of GDDR4 Corsair Vengeance running at 3600Hz, 2TB worth of SSDs, and the latest drivers from AMD. All of this powered by UGA's 850W PSU. Do note that the card comes OC out of the box, having higher clocks than the reference model. I've also undervolted and overclocked it further to try and get more performance, but mainly is to keep power and temperatures down. 850 watts is really tight for this, and the PSU has shut off several times when testing at stock without undervolting. Now, let's get on to the benchmarks. First up are the synthetic benchmarks from 3D Mark. This card got 16,500 on Port Royal, which looks at ray tracing, 12,000 on Time Spy Extreme, which simulates DX12 gameplay, and almost 21,000 on Fire Strike Ultra, which simulates DX11. Gathering the data uploaded to 3D Mark, the AIB model is right in between the 4080 and the 4090 in terms of rasterization, and in between the 3090 Ti and the 4080 in terms of ray tracing. We'll now look at the gaming benchmarks, starting with Doom Eternal. It uses ID Software's proprietary engine and the Vulkan API. On Ultra Nightmare graphics settings and without ray tracing, we can get extremely high frame rates with 1% lows above 240fps on 1440p, and a solid 240fps gameplay is possible on 4K. With ray tracing on, we can get an average of 250 FPS on 1440p and 154 FPS on 4K without any noticeable stuttering. Our next game is Control, which uses the Northlight engine and is on DirectX 12. Using the highest quality preset, we are reaching 120 FPS and 80 FPS averages on 1440p and 4K purely using rasterization. With ray tracing enabled, performance halves to 60 FPS on 1440p and a cinematic 40 FPS on 4K. Fortunately, control is still very playable at its frame rate, but turning down the quality settings could get you much better gameplay. And a game that needs higher frame rates for smooth gameplay is Apex Legends, using the Source Engine and DirectX 11. At the higher settings with anti-aliasing, both 1440p and 4K run smoothly, nearly hitting 300 FPS. Although the 1% and 0.1% lows are much lower at 180 and 130 FPS respectively, you'll barely be able to notice it and it won't hinder you in the most intense gunfights. In the same in-game universe is Titanfall 2, also using the Source Engine and DirectX 11. Both 1440p and 4K are able to run at very similar performance. Using the higher settings and texture quality, the average frame rate is at around 140 FPS, and the 1% and 0.1% are at around 110 FPS, so you can get extremely stable gameplay. Moving on to The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, using the Red Engine and DirectX 12. With Ultra Plus settings and ray tracing turned off, we are able to get very smooth gameplay at 165 FPS on 1440p, as the 1% lows are near 120 FPS. 4K performance is also decent, and getting consistent 60 FPS is possible. The game, however, becomes a stuttery mess with ray tracing enabled, so you have to greatly lower your graphics settings if you want to even play at 1440p. I don't have Metro Exodus, so we'll have to make do with Metro Last Light Redux, running on the 4A engine and DirectX 11. We've got over 300 FPS average and a 1% low of 173.8 on 1440p, while 4K averages at 184 FPS with a 1% low of 110. 
Up next is Left 4 Dead 2. Old but gold, it runs on the Source Engine and DirectX 9. Here we have 1440p and 4K both hitting 300fps, with a 1% low of 182fps on 1440p and 168fps on 4K. Also on the Source Engine and DirectX 9 is Portal 2, with both 1440p and 4K hitting 290fps as well. Here however, the 1% lows are much higher at around 240fps, and the 0.1% lows aren't far behind at around 210fps. Moving away from the Source Engine, we've got popular roguelike Hades running on Unreal Engine and DirectX 11. Using max settings and vSync turned off, we get extremely high frame rates reaching nearly 600fps on both 1440p and 4K, with 1% lows also above 300fps. I would advise turning vSync on though, as there's no frame capping anywhere in between, and if not tuned properly, very strange artifacts and glitching may occur. Next on our list is Verdun, which uses Unity and DirectX 11. On ultra settings and post-processing effects turned on, we've got 134fps average on 1440p and 114fps on 4K. 1% lows are at 91fps and 84fps respectively, and the 0.1% lows are at 76fps. On to Death Stranding, the movie with a little bit of game. It uses the Decima engine and DirectX 12. With very high settings on 1440p, you get an average of 177fps and a 1% low of 140fps during gameplay. On 4K, you get a similar average of 175fps with a 1% low of 129. Next is Fallout 3, using Gamebryo and DirectX 9. The settings had to be done each time I booted the game and can't be changed after booting which seemed kinda weird. With details set on Ultra, anti aliasing set to 8 samples, and an isotropic filtering set to 15 samples, we've got an average of 103fps on 1440p and 60 on 4K. 1% lows on 4K was close behind the average, but it seemed to be further apart at 44fps on 1440p, meaning worse micro starters. There isn't too much action in the game however, so this much is still bearable. Following that is everyone's favourite game Minecraft but with the SEUS shader. It has added texture quality and reflections, which pushes the GPU that much harder. There are a ton of settings here, but not all of them are maxed out yet. I've tried, but it becomes absolutely unplayable. Pause it if you want to have a more detailed look. 1440p averages at 167fps, and 4K at 107. However, lag spikes will turn this game into a slideshow with 1% lows on 1440p at 25fps, and on 4K, it is an abysmal 2.8fps. Guild Wars 2 is our token MMORPG, we've tested different scenarios from low loads such as fields, medium loads like player hubs, and high loads like raids. Here we use the Choya Pinata. The places here are in DLC but I've checked out Divinity's reach and its surroundings and it seemed to be about 30fps higher in some parts but about the same everywhere else. With the higher settings in 1440p, we get low load averages near 180fps, medium load averages at 78fps, and high loads at 39fps. 1% and 0.1% lows on medium to high loads seem to be about half the average, but those on low loads are roughly a quarter of it. 4K loads seem to dock 10 to 15 FPS across the board for medium to high loads, while low loads in 4K seem less affected, with 1% and 0.1% lows going down 3 and 5 FPS respectively. The low load average on 4K is completely unaffected, the 1.6 FPS difference is really within the margin of error. The second last game is Warframe, a game I play on the regular. It runs on the Evolution engine and is on DirectX 11. This game really used all 100% of the GPU. With the higher settings and all effects turned on, the classic graphics pumps out 235fps average and 131fps 1% lows on 1440p, and 222fps average and 123fps 1% lows on 4K. The enhanced graphics engine lowers the average by about 40fps, but raises the 0.1% lows up slightly, with 1% lows roughly staying the same. And finally, our last game... Welcome to our... Oz. It averages basically 1000 FPS and the 1% lows are barely noticeable. Above 240 FPS, you really can't see the difference. Let's get on with thermals. At stock, the edge ran at around 66 degrees Celsius with the junction hitting 80 degrees Celsius. After tuning and a more aggressive fan curve, edge temps got capped at 55 degrees Celsius 
and junction temps didn't go above 70. Sure, after hours of continuous gameplay, it might eventually get hotter, but the larger heatsink won't let temperatures get to the point of throttling performance. There was no coil wine at Hades' 600 FPS or even in Osu's 1000. However, I did run into a case of it when in Verdun's main menu where FPS soared to over 1300. I got this card for just under 2 grand in Singapore dollars, which after accounting for tax of 7% and exchange rate of 1.35 SGD per dollar, equates to around 1400 USD at the time of purchase. This was pretty much the cheapest one available, and yet is above the MSRP by over a quarter of a grand. Power Color's Red Devil was at 1500, Sapphire's Nitro Plus was at 1534, and MSI's Mac was at 1600. Base models for the XTX were around 1300, and the XT's versions weren't much better at over a grand. Even the base models. Meanwhile, the 4080s were going for roughly the same prices as the XTX, around 1500 to 1600, and the 4090s god forbid, can go for anywhere between 1800 and 2300 for air-cooled, with the ARS Extreme Liquid going for a whopping 2500. And prices have since gone up as we got a tax hike of 1% as the new year came. From an engineering standpoint, this is an amazing piece of work. Watching all of the reviews that have come out in the past few months, it is safe to say that not only AMD, the engineering teams in both companies have really absolutely outdone themselves trying to push as much performance out of these cards. Even considering the power increases, it's still very difficult to try and get that much performance uplift every single generation. The prices, however, are less than ideal. Coming out of the pandemic era pricing, we would have expected things to have settled down a lot more. However, seeing that the XTX is going for more than a grand, and AIB models for the 4080 are going for even the base price of a 4090, things are absolutely ridiculous right now. If you have a Turing or an Ampere card from Nvidia or even a 6000 series from AMD, there really isn't any real need for you to upgrade this generation. Unless you are a content creator or a working professional, the performance uplift is not worth the money. If people can vote with their wallets, not buy the 7900 XT, 4080, or the 4070 Ti, perhaps it will bring a message to Nvidia and AMD that these prices are really ridiculous, and hopefully in the coming few months, prices would drop down to more acceptable levels. This is really an issue of don't blame the product, blame the price. That's it for the gaming benchmark. It took way too long to tune and test all these games. While I have even more games in my library like Ark, Destiny 2, Dishonored 1 and 2, and Total War Warhammer, the original game, it is hard for me to do so since the new college semester is here and I don't have all the time in a day to continue benchmarking. Furthermore, this video is long enough as it is. I bet that more than 80% of my viewers have already clicked off. If you're still here, hi! You're amazing and thank you for sticking around. Now, if you want to see more and more accurate gaming benchmarks, go ahead and watch Gamers Nexus, Hardware Unboxed, and all the other tech tubers. This video took way too much work and it makes me respect them for what they're doing all the more. It's Kai, thank you so much for watching and hopefully I'll see you guys in some other video. Peace.